You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options And now it's time for the show that breaks down the options market from unusual activity alerts to market analysis, strategy overviews, listener questions, and much more. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo from the Options Insider Media Group and co-hosts Uncle Mike Tussaud from RCM Asset Management, Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Venazzi from OptionPit.com, and Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian from OptionPit.com. And now, get ready to hit the Option Block. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Option Block. This is indeed... As the name implies, hopefully your favorite, I know it's my favorite, hopefully it's yours, bi-weekly source for all things options related, a little bit of options wit, a little bit of options wisdom, a little bit of education, and of course, some unusual activity, and we pepper in a lot of other fun nuggets and gems and pearls of wisdom and insight, and we stir them all together, and we give you the option block. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever-exciting, ever-expanding Options Insider Radio Network. No shortage of programs for you guys to devour at your leisure on the old network. And, of course, the old Option Block streams every Monday and Thursday, 3 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. Eastern. If you are so inclined to join us live, we'd love to have you on there. As well as, of course, Volviews on Friday, 12 p.m. Central. And, uh, oh, Twifo, forgetting Twifo, 3 p.m. Central. They're streaming live. You can also get them the following day on demand on our network the following morning usually so it's out there bright and early for you guys a nice polished and beautiful edited version of the show if you go live you get to hear how the sausage is made which may be fun for you if you are indeed so inclined and of course you can always find our stuff itunes tune in stitcher wherever you find your favorite podcast programs and speaking of those programs maybe one of your favorite hopes maybe not i don't know it's a coin flip whenever he's on but we have him on nonetheless he is the Rock Lobster himself, Mr. Andrew G. I'm just going to call you G for the rest of the show. How's that sound? By way of the pit, we also call him the Rock Lobster around here. Mr. G, welcome back to the program, sir. It, it, it's so good to be here. I can't even remember the last time I was here. It feels like, I, I can swear it's like last week. Yeah, I can swear. It does seem that way. Does anybody call you G around the Duchy of Maine? Um, or are you just I, world I have famous? A couple of G's, I have a couple of G's here and there couple of G's here and there. Are you just world famous as the Rock Lobster now? Um, I yeah, Actually, I am not. I have not been noticed in my homeland as the Rock Lobster or my <laughs> current homeland. We so. haven't penetrated deep into the heart of Maine yet. Well, that'll be on our team. No, I do, I, did have, I do have a lot of clients that are from Maine, but um, they uh, – but <laughs> nobody's actually – I don't think they've called – I've had any lo- Rock Lobsters as of yet. You think that not that nickname that. would resonate in the Duchy of Maine, but apparently not. You know, uh, lobster here, I swear, it's it's just, you know, it's around. What can I say? There's a lot of it. You indeed are the Kuwait of lobsters. All right. With the team mostly assembled, Uncle Mike is indeed on assignment. I believe his assignment right now is taking him to Hawaii or somewhere else tropical and lovely. But we'll we'll do our level-headed best listeners to carry on without him and dive right on into the trading block. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for the trading block. All right, everybody. Welcome to the trading block. Like the name implies, this is indeed the portion of the program where we break down what was moving, what was shaking, what was rocking, what was rolling in today's market activity. A bit of an interesting one, Mr. Rock Lobster. You know, everyone was kind of, whenever she pops her head up, everyone's nervous and everyone was kind of on pins and needles today uh, with Miss Yellen popping up out of her hidey hole 
<laughs> to to wave her finger, wag her finger, really, at the markets. And people were a little nervous about that, but we ended up today uh, rallying fairly strong across the board. S&P up about six-tenths of a percent. Q's up about half a percent. Dow up a little bit higher, about seven-tenths of a percent. And good old VIX Cash uh, hovering on the 13 a half handle, which I believe is where I put it on for vol views last week. I'll have to go check. But somewhere on that level, I think I kept my level the same as when I won with you last week, Mr. Rock Lobster. As you recall, I believe you were 1295 and I stuck in the 13 half level. So uh, so I got, that's two up on you, I think I have now. So I believe you probably would take umbrage at that, which is why I wanted to bring it up. I, I, I don't, I, re, I recall you just trying to you only like you 50 cented me you or nickeled me or something like that. I think it was much closer than to I did not. I, I am sure I did not go to the 13th the below 13. You went below. You said 1295. Those were your numbers. I, I went really? by 13. I even gave oh. you I gave you the option to go first. I gave you the lead choice, sir. So I let you I let you hoist yourself on your own petard to use the oh nautical gosh. terminology you guys are so fond of over there in the Duchy of Maine. I, I cannot believe. I, I guess. Well, I definitely was low thirteen for sure. I guess twelve ninety five. All right, I'll give it. All right, you were there. You won. I'll concede. I still take umbrage at the loss because I think that's a bunch <laughs> of crap. It's all umbrage, baby, all the time when the Rock Lobster is on the program. And again, we are recording this on Monday. What is today's day? Today is the sixth. So D Day. Happy D Day anniversary to all of you out there commemorating this momentous day. And of course, we are streaming it live. You can also get it after the fact on Tuesday morning on the seven. Like I said, rally across the board. It was kind of interesting, Mr. Rock Lobster, because uh, Miss Yellen came out today, and uh, people were expecting her to spook people a little bit, but, may but maybe have a few less arrows in her quiver as a result of the the kind of dismal number last week, the non-farm number. That certainly took a lot of the emphasis out of the potential rate hike coming up just in a few weeks, perhaps, at the next uh, Fed meeting. Uh, she spoke today. She gave what was largely a quote-unquote upbeat assessment of the U.S. economy and said rates are, rate hikes are coming, but, uh, of course, didn't give any sort of insight into when. She said, I see good reasons to expect that the positive forces supporting employment growth and higher inflation will continue to outweigh the negative ones. She also commented on, on the jobs report last week, which we call, she called, quote, disappointing. I think that's, uh, that's Fed, Fed euphemistic speak. Uh, and she said it bears watching and po the policymakers will respond, quote, only to the extent that we determine or come to the view that that data is meaningful in terms of changing our view on the medium and longer term economic outlook. I would never want to be a speechwriter at the Fed because they have to put so much effort into saying nothing. It really is uh, an impressive bit of, uh, of work on their part, Mr. Rock Lobster. But uh, aside from her, once again, coming on and saying nothing, uh, what caught your eye about her speech, her comments, and maybe some of the market's reaction today, as well as anything else that caught your eye out there in today's market activity, sir? I'm beginning to think Fed speak is like the maze of the Minotaur, where you just keep walking and walking around in circles. And if you are not connected by a string to reality, you will get lost and be devoured by the beast. That is what I am now thinking about. Yes, yeah, so you have to bring the golden thread behind you, and uh, hopefully something. you are Theseus, and you could slay that beast, and then ride off, and you'll be happy on your on your on your Pegasus steed. If I if I, if I remember my myth correctly, I think you're. Uh, I think that's not too bad. And then not you turn home and forget to change your sails from black to white, and so your f father or brother or wife, whatever, throws themselves off the cliff in in dismay when you have actually triumphed. So there's a lot of tragedy <laughs> at the end of that myth as well, which a lot of good Greek myths always like to throw that little twist the knife at the end there. That's our Greek mythology is, minute for the day. It is a Greek myth. If there isn't tragedy, the inventors of tragedy, what I mean, where would we be in this world? So we have Yellen. We have she's saying, well, you know, all the other stuff, things aren't so bad. And it's only one employment number. And maybe we're not going to get off course because, you know what, the Treasury is the only thing I saw that was a surprise was uh, Treasury prices fell and yields rose after Yellen spoke. They were a little soft all day, but then the... So she's basically still saying the economy is growing. It's not super, but there's no reason to keep rates as low as they are, and they need to raise them so they can lower them back again sometime in the future. And I think that's kind of what the... I think that is why the, in the market is doing what it's doing. They're not going to raise them too fast. But they need to raise them 
uh, just because they're too damn low and they need to get all the other central bankers off their uh, off their interest rate or their free money printing exercise that they continue to do. So I guess we got to print all the money first and now we're going to start raising rates and not let anybody else do it. So um, I find that kind of funny. Um, but stocks overall, they they don't care. I mean, ultimately, we're at the point now if I, again, I think I said this a couple, what, last week with after the action, I will not be surprised if we see all-time highs, you know, before the 4th of July. Um, that's where we are. There's no reason for us to rally, yet we do. So uh, I learned early on not to really fight a fight a bullish tape. So I will be of that same mind. I will not fight this tape. As far as Yellen goes, ultimately, the second part I think that's getting everybody a little giddy is oil price. Oil prices are holding up. They want to get to 50. They want to stay at 50. And I guess the the carnage in the oil patch in the U.S. brought production down enough. So I, I don't know how much market share OPEC got, but um, the talks of them not being able to cut successfully, cut, cut their production, and oil still going up. Again, I'm just kind of following my nose. It's not like I want to get go-go bullish, but... It doesn't look like oil prices are going down anytime either since uh, there's carnage all over fracking land in the middle of the U.S. <laughs> and I think that's where we stand. The market loves oil prices going up because it makes 10% of the S&P 500 chug along a little higher. Uh, interest rates firming up, good for banks. So I think we're kind of – we've the Fed has confused everybody long enough that they've succeeded in having stocks cross over into the fact that maybe they just don't give a damn about what the rates are anymore. There, there I said it. <laughs> How dare you? How dare you not give a damn about Miss Fel Miss Yellen and her endless attempts uh, to continue to pop her head up out of her hidey hole <laughs> and, uh, and just make herself continuously relevant even though so much of the data, despite her refusal to acknowledge it today, so much of the data – uh, pointing on the fact that the Fed is once again going to sit on their hands. I believe the uh, I believe the July excuse me the July is still somewhat in the 30s. I believe maybe a little, which seems surprisingly high to me. But I think the June quote unquote Fed probability. I, th I think these probabilities are the grain of salt, but there are a lot of interesting people uh, analyzing these and looking at these. I think it's somewhere sub four percent right now, so effectively zero at this point. From my uh, looking at the actual probability that the market is putting in there on that June hike. Let's talk uh, something else that seems kind of interesting on the horizon here, Mr. Rockglass. I, I don't think we've talked about this, at least not you and I, on the old program before. It's kind of lurking in the background. We don't talk currencies a lot here on the show because for a long time, currency was a, was a dead category from a volatility and from a lot of interesting standpoints that usually catch our eye here on a program like this. But certainly over the past six months to a year, currencies have certainly been... A, a wee bit more active, a little bit more volatile, I think you could say. And now, of course, this impending debate out there in the UK, will they, won't they? This song and dance is coming up. Their June 23rd referendum uh, is uh, is rapidly approaching, and so people are starting to freak out. Polls, another two polls coming out uh, this morning, actually, uh, saying uh, more, uh, more Britons favoring leaving the EU than those who want to stay. That, of course, is freaking out people uh, across the board. Bloomberg actually had an interesting write-up, uh, Mr. Rocklops. I'm not sure if you, if you saw it. They went around and talked to a bunch of different uh, money managers and traders in the space and kind of, kind of polled them on what they were up to. Uh, some people out there were, uh, were buying VIX futures, some buying S&P puts, some going into cash. Some were kind of just doing nothing. Some were saying it's not going to happen, uh, kind of et cetera, et cetera. I'm, I'm curious, have you guys debated this in your uh, your pitch chat what are your thoughts on brexit and how if any are you really prepping for this going forward in your own lobster portfolios <laughs> uh we the thing that was been the most telling is the most expensive volatility in let's say the spy or the spx uh of the neck let's say what do we got seven or eight weeks of weeklies listed eight weeks of weeklies listed the most expensive all is on the June 24 cycle, which is the Brexit vote. So 
it's still the most expensive ball. Um, so at least from that part of view, the market is valuing um, that vote higher than whatever um, uh, Mrs. Yellen is going to do on the, you know, on June, uh, what was it, what is it, June 15th? Is That's their next, uh, yes, June 15th. So that is, at least from where I'm looking, the market is pricing that volatility still very high. I thought like the good idea was time spreads, just buy that, buy that term and just sort of sell everything forward. Um, and I'm what I'm surprised at is how aggressively the S&P 500 is moving ahead of this Brexit thing. So, you know, my sense is everybody, there's like a little euphoria and all of a sudden that vote will get closer and there'll be a little bit more worry. So I don't know if we hit an all-time high or we get close to it and then there'll be the vote and everybody will be like, ah, what do we do, what do we do? We'll sell off a little bit before that. And then the next day everybody pokes their head out of the sand and says, oh, what does it matter that, uh, Britain is actually going to leave e European Union membership. So I think that's part of it. I mean, there's several reasons why they want to leave. I think all, some of it is economic, but some others is just, you know, uh, they're not really stoked to be run by Brussels anymore. A lot of those people are just appointed. Are they really even elected? And, you know, it's kind of a kind of a strange brew of governance in uh, the EU now, which, and I don't think the Brits are too happy with it, to be honest. So that's a signal to uh, the EU that maybe they need to do, uh, come up with a better solution to what they're doing. So um, as far as, as far as that goes, I would be surprised, but it can happen because I have been surprised before. Notice the recent 1295 VIX call that you beat me on <laughs> last week. The ultimate sucker punch in However, uh, in I think uh, ultimately we were the right direction. It was down from when we did the show. Um, but I would be surprised if that June 24th cycle volatility dropped very much unless the voting, unless the vote became really one-sided the other direction. Um, and I still think Yellen's in selling that forward volatility into the Yellen thing is still, still to me looks like a decent trade, but I have it on a little, so we'll see what happens, full disclosure. Also, uh, all we can do is we'll see. Speaking of seeing, uh, we put this question out for our question of the week, Mr. Rock Lobster. We asked our audience, I thought it was an interesting way, how are they prepping for the impending potential Brexit? <laughs> I hate that acronym. It's getting so bandied about. Uh, it's just become a thing, and it's uh, it's it's kind of funny. Uh, I uh, ironically though, let's say uh, so. We gave them these uh, these choices, Mr. Rock Lobster, and you can participate as well, listeners. If you follow us there on social media, head on over to Twitter.com/slash/options to cast your vote. It's a question of the week, so the vote will be up there for a few days. So you got some time. Uh, but as of now, it's only been up for a few hours. The early voting is in, Mr. Rock Lobster. We gave them the choice of buying S and P slash index puts and we put buying vol and we put in print we didn't we didn't specify because you can't really get that deep on a 140 character poll so we put in parentheses you know vix or vxx etc uh we put moving to cash or we put brexit won't happen uh so I, I put it to you mr rock lobster first off what is your choice of those three if any or maybe you have an alternative you already said your time spread so maybe you have an alternative and then b what do you think is winning our poll i still like the time spread idea as a trade idea um, what do I think is winning the poll is Britain's not going to exit. Yeah, you are correct, sir. Look at you uh, redeeming yourself uh, from the umbrage that was Volvues last week. Uh, Brics, Brec <laughs> Brexit not and not won't happen is uh, crushing you with 50 percent of the vote right now. Uh, number two is buying S&P slash index puts. Number three, buying vol. And then uh, paltry 5%, Mr. Rock Lobster, moving to cash. So 27% for buying the puts, 18% for buying vol, 5% for cash, and a whopping 50% for Brexit won't happen. So there we go. Our own little informal, informal early polling, Mr. Rock Lobster says. All of this madness is for naught. <laughs> Just like every time Yellen pops her head up on TV. All right. <laughs> let's, uh, with that little nugget... It's time for us to keep on rolling to one of my own personal favorites. I think the Rock Lobster kind of likes it, too. It's time for the Odd Block. 
It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by TheOptionsInsider.com. It's time for The Odd Block. everybody that funky tune not quite as funky as our twifo uh, music mr rock lobster i don't know if you're sure if you had a chance to check that out yet but that's pretty funky this is probably number two in the funkiness realm it is of course for the funky portion of the show the odd block the portion of the show where we break down some of the weirder the wilder sometimes it is downright head scratching and bizarre paper that is lighting it up in the options market today of course we put these detailed alerts on the website throughout the day. So stay tuned there, theoptionsinsider.com, if you want to read these intraday. You don't want to wait for showtime. Or, of course, follow us on social media where we put out all of these links as well. All right, kicking things off here in... Oh, you, I'm, I'm trying to think. This is not, probably not a newcomer, but I can't remember the last time we talked about this on the show, Mr. Rock Lester. It certainly has been a while. This is Calpine Corporation, ticker symbol, CPN closing today up about not a bad day for Calpine, about four and a half percent closing right sixteen dollars even. You don't see that too often here on the old odd block. This is the name that does about two thousand contracts a day doing a whopping, a crushing, a crazy town one of about twelve thousand contracts. And so about twenty to one. Calls over puts, so that, of course, uh, gives you some inkling, some inclination of what, indeed, we are going to talk about today. And what caught our eye today, listeners, was a little bit of call activity, as you might have guessed, but not that close to home, not weeklies, or not even like, what what was it we were talking about last week? Um, Xilinx that had the the daily calls (laughs) On the upside there, Mr. Rock Lobster, those are pretty fun. Not, not, nothing that close to home this time. A little bit farther away, all the way out to September. That seems like an eternity compared to some of the paper we've been seeing of late. So all the way out to September sick of uh, September. These were the 16 calls. They went up this morning. First caught our eye, a block of 5,000 going up. Paper selling for a buck, a buck even as the day went on. More size, over 2x for a total of about nearly 11,000 contracts uh, going up on the strike. Again, hitting the majority of those at a buck. Uh, After that initial lot went out, they were still offered at a buck for a while, so someone clearly had an ax to grind at that price. They also clearly got taken out. The stock movement certainly helped that as well. Uh, These things went out a buck 10 at a buck 15. Open interest, only 400 contracts. So clearly this is open in paper. Didn't see any stock or anything else with it, which is typical for these types of trades. These are usually done against a pre-existing stock position. This is someone looking to carve themselves out a wee bit, a yield, Mr. Rock Lobster, and they're doing it all the way out to uh, September. And they're getting themselves a nice steamf, <laughs> a nice .0625 uh, to, uh, to do it. Not bad, Mr. Rock Lobster, all things considered. I, I, this is a confusing one for me. I, I really was looking at the volume because it, I could say it's maybe somebody paid a dollar because the initial offer was a dollar ten and they were only ninety five bid. So I, I just can't see those things. I just can't see paper getting away with paying a dollar for those at the time. Um, and, but why would you write the sixteen? Why would you write those calls? For it. I mean, the only thing is I can think of is they're long some stock. They figured, okay, you know, we'll take this gap because this 70 cent, 70 cent gap is a lot for this stock. Um, that's all I can think of. But um, when all was said and done, look at the time in sales, there was basically how it all ended up was dollar offers for these things. Um, so... I mean, what are you going to do? They were offered a dollar, offered a dollar, offered a dollar. Somebody wanted to sell them, and they eventually got uh, they got scooped up, and the market locked up for a dollar. I mean, they're only a quarter over parity. Um, so a very, very confusing uh, bunch of paper to me, and finally all the dollar offers got lifted um, for about 20 cents over. So 
you you tell me why do you write those calls? Why do you write them for parody? You know, it's funny. It's funny uh, that you should mention that because I've just been I've been so beaten to uh, to the point of uh, of just uh, complete capitulation now on the odd block. We've seen so many ridiculous ways to to carve out some yield on this on this segment and people doing so many absolutely uh, ridiculous things that you know selling uh selling things out for a year for you know eight cents and, and stupid nonsense like that so in that frame of reference which is how i look at all things on the odd block these days these calls are are a spectacular sale <laughs> he actually got some <laughs> he actually got something for them he got himself about six percent all things come to pass yeah i think you could quibble with the time frame i think why yeah why sell straight up at the money all the way out in september uh maybe be a little bit more nimble with these guys and uh, maybe go a little bit closer to home and then you could kind of roll and adjust and kind of keep harvesting the whole way out september kind of locks you in for a long time at a at a level that's kind of interesting again i think they were probably uh motivated by today's gap you're right four and a half percent in calpine is uh is, huge is not uh it's not your typical day out there so perhaps he's betting on uh on a pretty aggressive fade can't dump his stock and so he's going to take a buck out of the market because they gave it to him and he's happy to get it uh yep. I, I can't say i completely fault him for that logic again well, how many we've seen crazier than this just probably in the last couple of weeks mr rock lobster so <laughs> this one is this one i put this up as pure genius this is a seven out of ten on the savvy scale compared to right. again our savvy scale is highly uh skewed towards madness exactly. so uh, so you take out a few so of what's those. funny is if we see these things trade like 25 cents in two weeks the guy's gonna probably send us a note he's gonna be laughing all the way to the bank you better send us a check and then we'll uh, <laughs> take the check and the note and uh it'll be nice but uh, instead <laughs> as we keep out holding out hope for we mock all these people and then we expect them to cut us checks mr rock i don't th- i don't think it really works that way what do you think um how how is our check how is our how is our that that big jar for all the checks? The odd block how, is it is it full yet? The odd, the odd block, block jar, jar on my desk. <laughs> so far, it has eight cents in it. I think that was from our friend <laughs> in uh, men's warehouse who threw a uh, handful I, of pennies into an envelope and licked it and s- sent it to us. The big <laughs> fu on the cover. I'm not sure if he, what he meant. Maybe he thought my initials were something different. I don't know. <laughs> it's probably one of your employees feeling sorry for us. Yes. They just drop the coins in. That's exactly Might have been Kyle. Kyle. Yes. Good old Kyle. Hoping to get some moxie when I come out to Chicago. This time. <laughs> All right. Instead, let's move on uh, to another newcomer here on the old odd block. Uh, this one is a, is a mouthful of a name. Let's just call it uh, L. DuPont because <laughs> the full name is uh, quite a mouthful. Ticker symbol DD. Double D closing today, sixty-eight dollars and seventy-five cents. Uh, this one is uh, does about oh about thirty-five hundred contracts a day, doing about fourteen and a half thousand contracts today. And about eight to one calls over puts once again, showing you where our attention was focused today. Again, not as far out as September, a little bit, a wee bit closer to home this time, all the way out to July. In particular, the July 70, 72 half going up on a bit of a ratio, 3,750 by 7,500. So a nice one by two going up over there. Looks like paper selling the 70s and then coming in to buy two of the 72 halves. Doing the whole thing, total of about 4000 by about 7500 some, some later papers that came in a little bit to the initial kind we saw. 3750 by about 7500 Again, about 7500 or so open on the 70s, which leads us to believe that perhaps this could, just maybe, possibly, be a bit of a roll. Looking at a chart here of good old DD the last month or so hasn't exactly been terrible. This thing was trading 64 bucks uh, oh, a few weeks ago, and now it's trading right around 69 or so. So it could be our friend got some nice action on his 70s. Doesn't want to get the heck out of Dodge, just wants to take some of that off the table and roll it on up the chain. He did the whole thing, the one by two, uh, for a buck 38 over 63 cents. Mr. Rock Lobster, what are your thoughts here on this one? Are you in the rolling camp as well, sir, or do you have some other highfalutin far-flung crazy esoteric even suggestion <laughs> well it's either i I'd st- whatever it is they still want to be long i think uh, you know you do that one by two for, even if you do it as a as if you do it as a standalone trade you're not rolling you take in a small credit you still want to be long wouldn't you 
I think they still they still want more out of DuPont. There's like there's some takeover. Is Monsanto getting bought out or maybe getting bought out? Maybe all these chemical companies. I, I'm not. I still think somebody wants to be long this thing. So they're either rolling and they're taking their money, um, doubling the contract size. Uh, but I still think they want to be long. I, I wish I could get more highfalutin, but ultimately, I think that's what they want. Yeah, no stock, no uh, no nothing else on here. I was just looking at some of the, the charts here on good old DD. And if you're not familiar with them, they are a science and technology-based company. Uh, their business is aggregated into multiple segments, agriculture, electronics, et cetera, biosciences, and so on, and so forth. And it looks like you're right, Mr. Rock Lobster. They kind of... They liked it. They liked making some money. Now they want to put a little bit of money away and then keep the train rolling. Uh, let's move on. Speaking of rolling, let's move on to our final name, our final victim here on the old odd block today. I think this might be uh, this might be a trifecta. Correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Rock Lops. It might be a trifecta of newcomers here on the show. Do you do you concur with that assessment? I, it's hard to believe we've never had Dupont before, but I think. I can't remember the last time I wrote up a DuPont one. I don't think I've written up a Calpine probably. I don't ever. So, yeah, and maybe even, yeah, your final. I think I think we are. We're doing the, uh, we might be doing the trifecta of newbies. <laughs> Newbie trifecta here on the old odd block. All right, we're going to close out the old odd block segment with uh, Enterprise Products Partners LP. Ticker symbol EPD closing today twenty eight dollars and ninety cents. Uh, this is the name that does oh, up about two percent on the day. This is the name that does about eighty four hundred contracts a day. So that, from odd block perspective, fairly robust, doing about thirty thousand today. A sixteen and a half to one calls over puts. So we're kind of firmly in the call camp today on the odd block listeners and what caught our eye yet again was a little bit longer term paper this time not june not the weeklies not july no all the way out to sep and beyond that'd be good a good options based show mr rock lobster welcome to sep and beyond i have a bit of a star trek vibe uh, to that. it'd be kind of boring when you're doing it uh in the non uh, non q3 q4 time frame but still uh, interesting uh, nonetheless and what we saw our eye what caught our eye i should say in sep and beyond was a bit of a a bit of a roll up of some short premium. In particular, it was the Sep twenty seven Jan thirty one roll, doing it about twelve thousand times. Looks like paper coming back to buy back that short premium on the Sep twenty seven line, and then rolling it on up to the thirty one handle, doing that for two fifty five over a whopping eighty five cents. Uh, doing that, like I said, total of about uh, about 12000 and some change on each. Open interest on the 27 is pretty sizable, about 13,000 contracts. Open interest on the Jans, not so much, about 4,000 contracts. So clearly our friend taking advantage of some recent movement in good old EPD to do the old up and out or in this case, roll against and away from the recent movement. Looking here at a chart over the past three months here in EPD, and this thing has moved from about the 25 handle or so, actually even lower back in late April. It was about 23 and a half, all the way up to, like I said today, right around $29 today. So our friends, 27 strike that may have looked optimistic for September, now deeply in the money, uh, but clearly he doesn't want to give up the ghost or indeed his stock, so he's deciding discretion. The better part of Valor rolling on up and out to the 31s, taking his lumps, Mr. Rock Lobster, but keeping hope alive. What's your what's your feel? What's your take here on this uh, bit of funky roll here in EPD? I think there was surprise. I think uh, somebody there's, you know, that's pretty common. A lot of funds will sell calls against the underlying position in um in in all these pipeline companies and i think this 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 person just got got caught a little bit they you know but i think they stayed disciplined they wouldn't let the stock get too far ept get too far from their short strike and they're rolling up before you know they they get run over uh, and it's clear that it looks you know you don't know that they're long stock but again 
you sit on a trading floor long enough and you see the same type of trades over and over again, 95% of the time there, it's somebody with a big stock position, you know, it pays a dividend, um, and they're rolling calls against it. Um, and they're actually trying to get in front of, um, you know, a takeaway on a divvy. So it, that kind of call rolling action is somebody's a little more bullish. Normally, you know, they're like, ah, you know, we'll let, we'll keep the short call for a while and see what happens. Maybe we have a chance to pull back, but they kind of just, uh, this customer, they just said, you know what? We're not going to wait that long. We have a July divvy and we don't, we don't want to take an assignment chance. So, um, that's what it looks like. But you see some of this and it's kind of, I was the subject today in our pit chat a little bit, um, looking at, you know, maybe there's some, the oil patch is kind of stabilizing. Everybody thought $20 oil and got to 25 or 26 for a little bit, but ever since then. So uh, amazing what happens, you know, the price goes down low enough and uh, people stop producing. So I, I think at least uh, this, you're making a comeback, but this is an aggressive, I would say, uh, let's just call it a, a save on the roll. They don't want to let this get too far away from them. All right, sir. That is going to do it for the odd block segment. But now it's Monday. This is usually where we give Uncle Mike a time to rant on at length. But he is indeed enjoying the uh, <laughs> enjoying a nice cruise somewhere, I believe, in the Pacific. So instead, we'll give you guys some extra time on the show. Why wait till Thursday when we could do it today? It's time to open up the mail block. It's time to take your seat on the all-star panel as we read your emails, tweets, Facebook messages, website comments, and much more. It's time for the mail block. All right, everybody. Welcome to the mail block. This is indeed the portion of the program where you guys get your chance to direct the conversation here on the old program. You can send your questions in lots of different ways. We take them by carrier pigeon, even if you can get them over here to the studio in Chicago. If you're not local, you can hit us up a bunch of other ways. The website, probably the easiest place. Everything's all baked in there. The website feedback form, social media, everything. Or just find us on the site yourself, twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, stocktwits.com slash options insider. Via our mobile app, of course, has it all baked in there as well. I'm sure I'm forgetting a few, but uh, we'll get to the oh, live chat. You guys can send us your live questions as well. If you're streaming live, after the fact. All right, Mr. Rock Lobster, do you have your question, answer, and pants on, sir? I have some pants on. But I have that, to make sure the question answering part <laughs> is working. That's a win. Whenever you have pants on on the show, that's a win, uh, which is <laughs> nice to know. All right, let's kick things off. But in off. the summertime in Maine, you never know. It's That's not always, I could just have swim trunks on. It's not. It's not a layup having pants on. That's true. You Mainers are, are pants optional over there in that neck of the woods. So uh, that's why we don't make it a video show, Mr. Rock Lobster. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. And listeners, we love it when you guys take the rain. So we're going to let you do just that here on the old program. They want to start us out, Mr. Rock Lobster, uh, in scandal territory. Uh, I know this one's been catching your radar. I know Sebastian's been all over this one recently. We haven't had a chance to really chat about it. I have to admit I wasn't that familiar with it until a bunch of you guys out there started hitting us up on uh, all this stuff. This one comes from Andy Noble. He wants to know, what do you guys think about this scandal over the super trader? Another black eye for options, question mark. Uh, Mr. Rock Lobster, you guys have been following this a lot more than me, so I'll let you take the lead on this one. Maybe you should start by explaining what the heck he's actually talking about. Um, I think he's talking about Super Trader. I think her name was Karen. She sold she sold Index Premium. Um, I guess she started 2009, and I guess uh, uh, you know a, a couple other uh, option outlets, shall we say, kind of were championing her. Uh, I know I'll let Mark do the big rant on Volviews or something this week or maybe Thursday. But, um, it, you know, it turns out that, well, maybe she wasn't as super after all or maybe she had a black eye. But apparently 
Um, but basically what she did is just sold naked puts. And it was always a conversation in our option pit. You know, we have clients come in because, you know, we're, we basically say that works great until it doesn't work. That's the bottom line. So if you have one strategy where you say, okay, I'm just going to sell all the money puts all the time, it can work great for a while. And then, Mark, as you know, um, it doesn't work so good. <laughs> and uh, that's when we teach people about volatility and how you could sell an option for a dollar and it can go to 25 bucks. And the markets, you know, might not even be down 5%, but the, the option can just explode because the volatility can go up as fast or faster the market goes down. So if you've got the margin to handle that, okay, that's one thing. But most people are not used to selling something for a buck and watching it go to 25 bucks or even two or three bucks and watch it go to 25 bucks. So it always puzzled me how – what their management routine was. I didn't – couldn't understand, you know, there's been a couple of pretty good-sized shocks. So, uh, you know, how – I'm just looking at, okay, you've got X dollars in margin. You know, what's your routine to be able to? We've had a couple of market shocks. Um, so I, it was a little confusing. You know, we had that kind of semi-flash crash uh, last year. And again, we dropped down to 1,800 again. So – Again, not not sure how, con considering what they were selling, how they managed it or how they managed the, the margin problem. Um, so I used that's what I tell my clients. I go, I don't know. I don't know what the problem is. I don't know. I don't know how they do it. She must be super awesome because I can't figure it out. Um, now apparently there were customer complaints, something along those lines, and. It looks like she was rolling losses using time spreads and she was kind of structuring them in a way where she was trying to keep the gains forward and just keep putting the losses off until probably she they sold enough premium to make their money back if the market didn't crap out before. But, you know, sometimes then you have another sell off and you get kind of you get sort of stuck in a loop that you're never going to be able to get out of. Um, which has happened before on other trading desks, like, you know, like the Nick Leeson guy and the Metal Gashelsaf guy and all these guys that kept selling puts and it worked really great. And then it was really bad and they took the bad trade and they tried to hide it in their desk drawer somewhere. And hope nobody would find um, find the problem. And I guess the yes, somehow uh, either was a client or something caught wind of it and now they're investigating her, they're investigating the firm. And that's where it is. So the question is, is it a black eye for options trading? Well, you know, yes. Could it have been anybody doing anything? Sure. Um, is it good for our business? No. It's never good for our business when somebody does something and they try to use the market structure to sort of hide, a, you know, a gain or a loss when they're charging somebody, um, you know, especially performance dollars or for really for any reason. Um so that's uh, sad. Um, unfortunately, just sad. That's all I got to say. Sad, and we'll see what happens. The, you know, the SEC will do their thing, and they'll figure out what's wrong. And I'll be wondering if we see somebody that just sells a bunch of naked options again. I just – you can sell some sometimes. It's hard to sell it all the time without any sort of – hedge or risk control or anything like that um but that's where it is but as it is it is another black eye for options unfortunately uh we will move on and again another reason for understanding the risk of the positions or the risk that you give somebody money to do but so. mr rock lobster we saw hard data coming out of uh, the rmc and others that uh put selling is the new uh, the new trade du jour it's the new hot thing put selling always works uh, how could that data? How could that data lie to me, sir? I, I call lies to your lies. I take I umbrage at your lies. I think put selling can work. Every old scandal is new again in the options market. I like that. Um, it's you can sell them. I'm not saying you can't. I just say it's it's hard to do the same thing every month and make it work. Um, but. If you're a long-only strategy, uh, it depends on much margin. If you, 
if you sell those puts fully margined, you could survive those. You could you can can roll those things. Um, the problem is, is I think a lot of times, uh, at least I've seen, is people sell puts, but they're really not fully margined, or they're over they over leverage them. So when things blow up, they have to cover them because they run out of money. If you're if you're if you're fully margin on the put, at least you don't have to cover them. It doesn't mean that you're not going to make your that doesn't mean that you're not going to lose some money, but at least you're not forced to close. And usually what happens, it's the forced close that makes things really nasty because um, worst comes to worst. When you sell a put, you're going to be put hopefully what you think is a stock at a good price. And at some point in the future, the stock will go up with with index options that settle the cash. You don't have that ability, right? So, because it's kind of game over, uh, because it's cash settled and you win or you lose, and you're like, "Oops, I just have a big black eye in my account now." There's nothing I can do about it. You don't get the stock, you don't get the divvies, you don't get anything. So, I think, yeah, I think put selling certainly can work. Um, I think put selling in the indexes is pretty tough, unless you have some sort of spread or some sort of routine that mitigates the risk. You know, it is funny. I, I was joking about every old scandal being new again, but this is kind of the oldest scandal in the books from an options perspective. You're right. Bearings, the bearings scandal, one of the kind of originals uh, from uh, an options disaster perspective. One of the things that first kind of drew me into this business many, many years ago. So many people were talking about derivatives. I had to figure out what the heck they were talking about. I had to go learn about these things. And that's kind of what drew me to the dark side. And I've been uh, stuck here ever since. Uh, but so, yeah, and that was the exact same thing. He discovered the magic of selling premium and then all of a sudden didn't work out too well. And let's just add a few premium buying trades and a few other offsetting trades into the account to make it look like we're not hemorrhaging money. A few people sent us links to uh, the SEC report, the SEC filing. I think they allege $50 million was the loss that they were ceiling in this, which is pretty substantial. Uh, and they were doing it all essentially to continue getting those incentive fees. Uh, I guess that's a strong incentive to scam, huh, Mr. Rock Lobster, when uh, you can just put a few fake trades in and you keep getting your two and 20. Uh, there are worse things, right? Um, yes, I don't, I don't, again, as a, as the risk manager for our little fund, um, I don't, <laughs> I don't think that's a very good idea to do. I think that's bad. <laughs> That's but apparently was their incentive, I guess, instead of just saying, okay, well, we're just down 25% this quarter and starting over again. But then that would, then you'd have to admit that maybe the strategy was not as good as you thought it was. So. All right. We've got but, a, we've got a, a somewhat live question here coming in by a Twitter. It's from Andrew and Andre, Andre Chiles. He has the very simple question, Mr. Rock Lobster. He first off, he wants to know how we're doing today. So he's very polite. And he says, I'm new to the market, but I was wondering if you could help me learn and make some money. So that's all he wants. He wants to learn and make some money right now. Uh, <laughs> it's very, some very simple demands uh, from our listeners. Well, I think I would point you uh, the easiest place to go. Uh, check out, of course, you're listening to this show, so that helps. You're in the right direction. Check out the archives of this show. Check out our options boot camp program where we break down a lot of great educational topics all completely free, as well as, of course, our Options Playbook radio program that, of course, does that as well every week uh, with our friends over there at Trey King and Brian Overby. So there's a lot of educational content coming your way from the network. If you're so inclined, you want to get a little bit in the deeper end of the pool, check out Vol Views. That's a fun one as well. And, of course, read all the free sites, Options Institute, OptionsEducation.org, our site, plug, plug, shameless plug. Uh, and then when you've consumed all that and you think you're ready to move on to the next level, maybe open up a paper trading account so you don't spend any money on that. And then when you are ready to start allocating some additional funds, you think, to your education, maybe you contract, or excuse me, you contact, or you can contract him as well. I think it works that way, too. Uh, our friends over here, like Mr. Rock Lobster, and have him sit down and actually explain to you how this stuff works in a little bit more detail. Mr. Rock Lobster, would you concur with that? Is that the fastest track to, quote, learn and make me some money? Yes, that is an excellent track. It's just teaching yourself how the options are going to work first because um, you, 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 the market has enough surprises. You don't want to be surprised by stuff that you should know. That's what I would say there. So, But that is a way to do it. I like it. <laughs> Speaking of ways uh, to do things, let's see. we got time for another one. Let's do uh, this one comes from this is my favorite handle. Uh, of the day, certainly of the week, maybe of the month or the year, Mr. Rocklops. It comes from Mr. Niggles. That's his handle. 
<laughs> and he writes, I saw the headline link on Options Insider about the stock replacement strategy. What do you think of using this strategy in the current market conditions? I believe he's referring to, we put out a lot of news links throughout the day, Mr. Rock Lobster. If you're not familiar with that, listeners, head on over to the website. You can find it all that. Bottom right corner of the homepage there is our breaking news ticker. We also tweet out a lot of the links as well, so you can find them there as well. Uh, different headlines that catch our eye that kind of are summary of the day's news from an options perspective. And we did. There was an article, I believe, recently. I think it, Reuters or Bloomberg, one of those, writing up uh, about the stock replacement strategy. Anyone listened to this show for a while knows that's one of my one of my old school favorites up there with the bullish risk reversal and the iron fly and a few others uh, of a strategy I like. And it's very effective in a variety of scenarios and I recommend it in, in most most scenarios. I don't like people sitting and holding a bunch of underlying unless they really have to. There's so many reasons why using the options instead are certainly uh, advantageous. You get all the Greeks that you don't get with the stock positions, not just Delta, but Gamma, Theta, Big, all that other fun stuff, which can help you. Should the stock start moving against you, uh, of course, you also have much better leverage on the stock than you can do, or excuse me, on the options than you can on the stock. By the way, you're not familiar with stock replacement, look it up on our site, look it up anywhere you can find it, or of course, quick rundown, you go out by six months to a year, usually it could be a little bit longer term, uh, of uh, probably somewhere in the 70 to 80 delta in the money call range, and now you have a decent approximation of a pretty bullish position uh, at a fraction of the cost and all the other benefits. And of course, you could jazz it up, we've debated what the name of this strategy could be, but you could jazz it up, turn around and write some front month or even front week calls against that, now you got a bit of a time spread on. You've effectively done a covered call without using any stock whatsoever, and it has a lot of advantages over doing it from a stock, uh, excuse me, from a stock perspective. In this environment, yeah, it's even more favorable. If you are, that's of course with the big caveat that you want to go long ton of stock right now. Markets kind of tottering at some pretty high levels. We've got you know Yellen and Fed and Brexit on the horizon. Maybe you want to be cautious, diving full bore into equities, but if you are so inclined, it is still a pretty favorable environment for that. Again, I like this in most environments, but uh, lo relatively lower, comparatively lower uh, volatility levels means buying premium is usually more attractive. Again, your equity valuation outlook may differ, uh, but the strategy itself, fairly sound right now. Mr. Rock Lobster, I know you're also a fan of ye old stock replacement. What are your thoughts on it in general, as well as using it in the current market environment? I think you're, I mean, now you're starting to get cheaper option premiums, so you can buy longer term calls. I mean, think about it. How much does, if you, let's say you bought 100 shares of stock and the stock was 70 bucks, it's going to cost you $7,000 uh, for 100 deltas. Uh, you could probably buy 100 deltas for a tenth of that cost and keep the rest of the money in cash for something else or to maybe trade around your option position. Um, so if you think about it with VIX at 13, it's a lot cheaper than buying longer term options when the VIX is 35. Um, so, I mean, you're, you're getting, it's, it's the, it is, options won't be a whole lot cheaper than this than they are right now. And that gives you some pretty decent bang for the buck. So, um, you know, getting rid of stock, taking a bunch of money off the table, but keeping the same delta with a lot of dollars in cash, that I don't think that's a terrible thing as a, as a management, as a, as a stock management strategy. So plus you get to write calls against, um, the long calls that you have. So again, I think it's, it is a much better time to do that now than um, unless, of course, when the market's at the dead bottom and you want to roll out of your stock position to buy more deltas. But that's kind of another type of trade. This is the opposite where you're trying to take money off the table but keep the same delta, whereas opposed to when the market is totally tanking and you get out of your stock but you want to buy more deltas because you think the market's bouncing but you're trying to buy – you know, you started with only 100 deltas, but now you want to buy 150 or 160 deltas for a fraction of the cost. So that's also uh, another strategy when things are looking ugly. So there you go. There's two <laughs> stock replacement strategies. Technical terms, looking ugly. I like it. But yeah, this is one of this is one of my favorites, and it's nice. It's simple. Uh, you know, it's people can wrap their heads around it fairly easily, and uh, it's a nice way to get your toes wet 
in the world of options, and then you can go into the deep end with some, you know, turn it into a time spread and all sorts of other fun ways to do it just like that. But at the end of the day, definitely something you should be considering if you are a stock trader. All right, time for us to keep on rolling into our final segment time for Around the Block. It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for Around the Block. All right, Mr. Rock Lobster, we got Yellen coming up in a week or two. We got Brexit on the 23rd. We got a, a trickle, a tiny little uh, flow here of earnings coming out. A few interesting ones. Lululemon still on the radar. You remember, that's one of your favorite scandals. I know it's mine, Mr. Rock Lobster, of uh, the invisible yoga pants. <laughs> one, of the more, one of the more infamous Wall Street scandals uh, of recent years. They closed today. 68.75, up about 2%. So that one's had a nice little run since early May, up over about 12% or so since the beginning of the month. So actually middle of the month. So uh, this thing's on a bit of a run. Uh, H&R Block on Thursday and a few others. So if you're interested, Lululemon still want a decent fish in uh, the old barrel there. Aside from that, Mr. Rock Lobster, what's catching your eye for the rest of this week? At least until Thursday when we chat again. Um, I'll tell you what, I would, I'm just, I'm waiting for some pullback, but it doesn't seem like we're going to get it. I also want to see if the rest of the market agrees with me that the Yellen, uh, that the mid, the June ordinary cycle is going to just get destroyed uh, volatility wise. Those are the two big things. I, I didn't see anything today. Yellen, of course, like I said, she, she, she spoke in labyrinthine uh, <laughs> terms to totally confuse the crap out of everybody. But I think her confusion is making everybody not care about interest rates anymore. And maybe that's her end game. Who knows? You know, maybe she's like the lady on Alias who had a super complex end game and ended up getting what she wanted in the end. So, um, <laughs> it could be, it could be. You're but full I don't, of all sorts of esoteric references today, sir. I, I'm trying to, you know, you don't have Sebastian. We don't have Tusaw. If I don't make it somewhat exciting and enjoyable for people, uh, they just, they're just not going to download our podcast anymore. So, but that's, uh, I think that's for the week and also, Second part is just oil holding. Seems like oil was crushing the market early in the year, and now it, you know, when you think about where we are at 2100, and banks are still, I'd say banks are in a pretty decent position, but they're not really near their highs, so to speak. At least, let's say, like the XLF. I mean, it's still, there's another, it has another 10% in it, and oil obviously is still you know, way, 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 way off uh, highs as far as all of the drillers and explorers and stuff like that. So, and the S&P 500 is at 2,100 with two big chunks of the market, nowhere even near their highs, uh, far from it. So I find that um, I'm not trying to be overly bullish because I don't understand why everybody is so bullish. I don't get it. So it doesn't really matter whether I get it or not. I'm just saying there's still at least... 20% of the S&P 500, that is nowhere near its highs, which means, of course, that there's there could be more room. And Tucson can come back and say, there's never been a better time ever to sell your stocks in the S&P 500. So I still think that is going to happen if the current trends continue by, uh, by, late, by 4th of July. Speaking of time, sir, that music means... We are out of time here on this fine, fine program. Excellent job putting your talking pants on today, sir. Well done. But before we go one last time, let's check back in. Uncle Mike Tussaw, of course, couldn't be with us. Check out Go Long on Amazon. Reach out to them. Follow them on Twitter, RCM Wealth Advisor. I believe they're RCM underscore WA uh, to follow what's going on with those guys over there. And before we go, Senior Rock Lobster, what's cooking in the land of the pit, in addition to your risk management duties over that Carmen line where you're busy uh, wiping out all the short premium with the long premium, right? Just rolling, um, rolling for fees, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish it was that easy. But no. It's just, uh, you know, you sell some call, you sell some spreads and then you buy some puts. You sell some spreads and you buy some puts. It's kind of, you know, it's a full life. It's a full life. That uh, and, you, and you wear the Saturday C3 yoga class, pants. Saturday class for option pit. Iron Condors and Flies, Saturday class, June the 11th. Go to the Option Pit website and sign up. 
There you go, listeners. Optionpit.com to learn more. And on behalf of The Rock Lobster and Uncle Mike and indeed myself, I want to thank all of you out there in the listening audience for downloading, streaming, subscribing to the show. And, of course, for tuning in live every Monday and Thursday, 3 p.m. Central. The show comes out Tuesday and Friday right in the morning for you guys to enjoy on your commute or your workout, however you like to consume our program. We don't hold it against you. Just listen. That's all we ask. And we'll see you next time for more of The Option Block. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash theoptionsinsider, or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com. 